At both ends of this zone of landings are two very important ports. On the eastern side is Le Havre, which is one of the most important commercial ports of France, from where most of the ships used to go to America. On the other side is Cherbourg, the great military port, which was also used as a commercial port. Between these two important harbors, a series of small ports, such as Grand Caen, port en bessin and Trouville, can be very useful at the beginning of an invasion. Besides that, small ships can go up to the canal to Caen. It is now too early to try to guess what the Allied command's objective might be. But a landing along the Normandy coast would offer two possibilities. First, the Le Havre coast is the nearest point to Paris. If the penetration was successful, it would lead the Allied forces toward the capital of France not more than 120 miles away from the, uh, by the Seine Valley. This would have a tremendous military and psychological effect. The other possibility in the western part of the landing zone would be to attack towards Avranches and cut the Normandy Peninsula completely. This would liberate an important area which would be very useful for further landings of the Allies in France and perhaps lead to the invasion of the Brittany Peninsula. In case of heavy German counterattack, the Allies would then have the rather short defense line from Avranche to Caen. Anyway, according to the latest German reports, heavy fighting is now taking place in the Caen area. If this is true, the Allied troops fighting there are most probably paratroops. The intention would be to cut both the road and railway between Paris and Cherbourg by occupying the city of Caen, a city of now almost 100,000 population. This would isolate the northern part of Normandy, which would leave the German only secondary railways between Avranches and Saint-Lô and Cherbourg. Of course, all this is only conjecture, since we don't know anything about the High Command's intention, and we don't even know if this landing in Normandy will be the main effort of the Allied troops. It must be noticed that the Germans speak a very heavy bombing in the Calais zone. And it must be remembered, too, that hard fighting will probably take place before the Allies make their way through the deep German defense line. Now that the invasion has started, the tens of thousands of French people belonging to the underground movement backed by the whole French population, will do their best in sabotage work to prevent the Germans from sending supplies, ammunition, and, above all, reinforcements to the points threatened by the Allied forces. For the French nation, for our beloved country, the dawn of liberation has come. All the patriots in France will do their duty, the same as the French soldiers have been doing theirs, on all the fronts of battle since the beginning of the war. Well, you just heard a first-hand expert analysis of the military possibilities along the invasion coast of France by Lieutenant Colonel Victor M. Morrison of the French military mission in Washington. I return you now to New York. Columbia's news headquarters in New York, and now Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding, Fielding Elliott, is going to analyze some of the German military reports which we have got so far. Here is Major Elliott. The German radio has been busy telling the world what uh, the German propaganda ministry, at any rate, possibly the German high command, thinks the Allies are up to. And while we must regard all enemy broadcasts with the usual suspicion, the strategic picture which they are presenting seems to fit together fairly well as a pattern. It seems to be the German idea that the port of Cherbourg is our main objective. This port lies at the northern tip of the Normandy Peninsula. It could be isolated by landing paratroops behind it, which the Germans say we have been doing. And they also report a major landing from landing craft covered by naval forces near St. Vas la Hougue, which is on the eastern shore of the Normandy Peninsula and would threaten the rearward communications of Cherbourg. In addition, the Germans say that paratroops have come down at the important rail and road junction of Carentan, 
which controls the rail lines and highways leading into the peninsula from the southeast, that is, from the direction of Paris. These are German reports, but they seem to be the logical steps that the Allies would take if Cherbourg were, in fact, one of our major objectives, as it well may be, since it is a large and well-equipped port and would be very useful to a landing force. The Germans also say that other landings are taking place along the strip of coast between the Normandy Peninsula and the port of Le Havre, which lies at the mouth of the River Seine, about 60 miles east of the Normandy Peninsula in a straight line, though the length of coast between the two points is about 100 miles. They say that we are landing in the mouths of the rivers along this coast, the principal of which are the River Bear and the River Orne. This would also be quite likely, as an attempt to get the port of Le Havre, as well as Cherbourg, would make a good deal of sense, as you've just heard uh, Colonel Morrison tell you. But we must remember that these are all German reports so far, and we have had no word from any Allied source of the places where our landings are actually taking place, except for a British radio report just picked up by Columbia's shortwave listening station, which in a broadcast directed to Europe say that war correspondent dispatches state that the first reports of the Allied landings in Normandy are good. This is the first report we have had from any Allied source which has said that we were landing in Normandy. But that would seem to confirm, at least uh, so far as general direction is concerned, the German reports that we have received. Another German report says, uh, places the strength of the forces which have been landed by uh, from the air as four uh, parachute divisions. Well, actually, in the Allied forces, there is no such thing as a parachute division, but there is such a thing as an airborne division, which consists partly of parachute troops and partly of airborne troops in air transports in, and in gliders. The parachutists prepare the way by seizing a landing field, and then the transports and gliders come in when the landing field has been seized and prepared by the parachutists. If we have landed anything like four airborne divisions uh, behind the German lines to cut their communications, and especially to cut off approaches, the approaches to the Normandy Peninsula, it would seem that we would have a very good chance of success in this operation, or this would be an extremely strong force and probably a good deal stronger than the Germans could concentrate in that locality within uh, 24 or even 48 hours. So that the uh, remarks of Prime Minister Churchill that the operation has been successfully begun seem in this respect to be borne out by the Germans themselves in their statement of the size of the force that has been landed. The Germans, of course, uh, make various claims about wiping out uh, parachute detachments and so on, but the German radio is given to these extravagant claims, and against them we can put the sober statement of the British Prime Minister that at least the first phase of our operations is being successfully carried out. And now, here once again, is Bob Trout. We've been listening to Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott, here in uh, Columbia's news headquarters in New York City. We've had a bulletin from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, which has just come in from Great Britain. It says, German destroyers and e-boats are rushing into the operational area off the northern coast of France and no doubt are being dealt with by the Allies. This is the announcement which was made a few moments ago at Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force somewhere in Great Britain. An Allied military commentator there at headquarters announced that each hour for the invasion today ranged from 6 to 8 a.m. in Great Britain, which was midnight Monday to 2 a.m. Tuesday Eastern wartime. German broadcasts, you know, are saying that a furious battle between German e-boats and Allied warships uh, is raging off the Havre. But that is the latest official word from uh, the military spokesman at Supreme Headquarters that German destroyers and e-boats are rushing into the operational area and no doubt are being dealt with.
And now, once again, we're going to have word from Washington, D.C., so we take you now to the Pentagon building, which houses the War Department, and we take you to Washington, Joe McCafferty reporting. Military experts here at the Pentagon building point out that this invasion, like so many we have accomplished in other phases of the war, is a waterborne operation, for there are no land avenues open in order for us to reach and engage the enemy. In the past, landings against opposition have been made in greatest force besides the Pacific area in Africa, Sicily, and Italy. They also emphasize that this is not General Dwight Eisenhower's first experience with an amphibious operation. He was in supreme command of the joint operation in Africa, in which Allied Army, Navy, and Air units participated. In that operation, landings were made at or near Algiers, Iran, and Casablanca. The landing at Algiers was made not at the port itself, but at beaches several miles from the city, and the initial force consisted of rangers, infantry, artillery, and tanks. Two airfields, as well as rail and road approaches, were immediately seized and 16 hours after the landing, the French authorities agreed to surrender the city. In Sicily, the glider-borne air infantry, one of the finest trained units in the world, rugged from forced marches, from enduring all kinds of weather, from struggling through realistic maneuvers, this infantry from the air are flying doughboys. There, they played a major role. From these operations, and many, many more, the pattern for this D-Day had been fashioned. Most of the plotting, the working, the split hair timing was done in this building, which houses the Secretary of War, his staff, and General George Marshall, the Chief of Staff. For military experts here, hasten to point out that such a large-scale operation can't be planned one night and placed in operation the next morning. One point that was brought to my attention here was the fact that there was a staggering total of upper operational maps which went in with the platoons taking part in this landing. These maps had been made by the Corps of Engineers, the Army Air Forces, the best brains of G2, and thousands of GI soldiers with high degrees of skill. It might be well to point out that maps in war are as important as food. You can't travel without them. Most of these maps are based on aerial photography. Squadrons of P-38s and Spitfires were flown by specially trained pilots whose regular training was augmented with eight months of specialized navigation and instrument flying. Their task was to photograph enemy territory in solo missions, and they flew with 6-inch and 24-inch cameras as their only defense. I have talked today with Air Corps officers who point out that the Air Force has been taking part in aerial invasion for many long months. On the eve of invasion, targets for the 9th Air Force, Mustangs, Thunderbolts, and Lightnings were concentrated in a relatively narrow but important urban area of northern France and Belgium, crisscrossed with roads and rail lines from Germany, leading to the first line of pillboxes and trenches, and dotted with strategic air bases and cities. Now, these Air Corps officers emphasize, the 9th Air Force fighter bombers, as they did before D-Day, strike at large stationary targets, putting the finishing touches on the blanket bombing of the medium and light bombers of the Allied Expeditionary Air Force. Fighter bombing from British bases is the most recent phase of the Daylight Air Offensive. This huge office building, one of the largest and most modern in the world, is now beginning to take on its usual hustle bustle of the working day. Civil service workers are filing down the long corridors, walking among the officers who are wearing their summer suntans. The usual laughter of young stenographers going to work is missing. They are talking earnestly to one another about Tom, Jack, or Ted, who are over there. The officers walk hurriedly to their rooms. Let no one tell you that those in government are so close to the forest they can't see the trees. They feel the impact of D-Day, for they have watched it develop. Almost every office in this huge building, which houses some 35,000 people, had a hand in doing something towards preparing for the invasion. Secret and confidential material on plans for D-Day have gone through hundreds of trusted hands. One colonel, who has been keeping a chart on absenteeism, said that for the past few months the chart hadn't been used. They're always on the job, he said. Although only a chosen few knew when the day would arrive, the atmosphere here in the Pentagon building has been tense for several weeks. 
Only yesterday, when I paid a routine visit to the Bureau of Public Relations, my escort past the police guard said, I have a feeling that something is going to happen, and happen soon. I return you now to New York. Columbia's news headquarters in New York once again. Bob Trout speaking. Now let's go over the latest news that has come in while we've been listening to our correspondent in Washington, D.C. And uh, to remind you once again, some of this might be a bit repetitious because our audience is uh, gradually growing as the morning, the draw, morning continues in New York and as uh, people get up who haven't heard about the invasion. Uh, we shall continue to repeat the essential news as we run in the new facts which do come in. Now, here's the first one. London, June 6. Royal Air Force bombers last night blasted the Northwest German Railway Center of Osnabrück, the Air Ministry tells us, and all planes return safely. That answers our question about what the uh, heavy strategic bombers were going to do once the invasion started. Some people thought they would be called off strategic bombing altogether and would be used directly to support the invasion, but last night, which was... D-Day, Royal Air Force bombers were out after the Northwest German Railway Center of Osnabrück, the Air Ministry tells us, and they also tell us something which is rather unusual. All the Royal Air Force bombers returned safely to their bases in Britain. Earlier I told you that at Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force in Britain, a spokesman had said German destroyers and e-boats are rushing into the operational area off the northern coast of France and no doubt are being dealt with by the Allies. Those are the words of a military spokesman at Supreme Headquarters in Great Britain, and they were released about 30 minutes ago. Not quite that, as a matter of fact. A bulletin from an 8th United States Army Air Force photo reconnaissance base in Britain tells us Allied landing forces have established beachheads on the coast of northern France and are slashing their way inland. Now that's the very brief word that we have just had uh, from a United States Army Air Force photo reconnaissance base in Great Britain. That means that a reconnaissance pilot has looked down and has seen the beachheads which now exist on the coast of northern France, and the pilot has come back with the word that the troops who landed and established those beachheads are beginning to move in the inland, are beginning to move inland. Of course, we don't know how far they've gone. Actually, uh, that's uh, somewhat similar to some of the news that Prime Minister Winston Churchill had given in his statement in the House of Commons, uh, which uh, we have gone over briefly earlier. But as it does contain the very latest details and some very definite details, let's go over it again. Prime Minister Winston Churchill told the House of Commons that massed airborne landings have gone off successfully behind the enemy's lines in France. He said the landings along the beaches are still proceeding, but that the fire of enemy shore batteries has been largely silenced. The Prime Minister noted that many of the German ground defenses, especially those in the water, which we ourselves thought might be stiff to overcome, have proved to be less difficult than had been anticipated before the invasion began. And the Prime Minister revealed that more than 4,000 ships took part in the combined operation and that we now have about 11,000 first-line planes to support the ground troops. So far, continued Mr. Churchill, everything is proceeding according to plan, and, he said, what a plan it is. The Prime Minister admitted that the vast operation, or rather he said that the vast operation, is undoubtedly the most complicated and the most difficult that's ever been undertaken in the history of the world. But, he said, we shall furnish the enemy with a succession of surprises in the course of the fighting. And he warned that in the weeks to come, the battle will grow in scale and intensity. And that word, weeks, in the statement of the Prime Minister this morning, is a word that we should remember. Here's word from Russia that the Moscow radio has told the Russian people about it. At 6.45 in the morning, Eastern War Time, in other words, about half an hour ago, in a Russian language broadcast, which was recorded by the Federal Communications Commission in this country, the Moscow radio gave the Russian people the news of the landing of Allied armies on the northern coast of France. The Russian broadcast was given under a London dateline, and it reported the first communique of Supreme Headquarters factually and without comment. We've already given you that one-sentence communique several times, many times, I should say, and that communique, while it's the only one that has been given out, is uh, really outdated now by the remarks of the Prime Minister in the House of Commons. 
Well, from time to time during this night-long broadcast, which began almost uh, well, just shortly after midnight last night, from time to time uh, we've been waiting to see what Tokyo was going to say. And now we have the first reaction of the Tokyo Radio to the news that the liberation of the continent has begun. Here it is. Tokyo Radio's first reaction to the invasion was a broadcast in the German language, beamed to Europe, according to the CBS correspondent in San Francisco, who quotes Claude Buss, director of the Pacific Division of the Office of War Information. And the Tokyo broadcast says, quote, We have just learned with deep concern of the landings by the Allies on the coast of France. We expect says Tokyo, that they will be quickly annihilated by the courageous German armies. That's the full text of the Japanese announcement, a very short announcement, given in the German language. And that, so far, is all that Tokyo has said about it. That's a broadcast which Tokyo put out for foreign consumption. The foreign, in this case, means us. And so far, the OWI on the West Coast tells us the Japanese people have not been told the news that the invasion has begun. Now, those of you particularly who stayed with us all night, who began to listen to this all-night-long broadcast shortly after midnight last night, when we began with only the uh, German reports, the uh, German bulletins and announcements that the invasion had begun, those of you who uh, began to listen to us then before our own high command had said that the invasion had indeed begun will be especially interested in this warning from Elmer Davis, which Mr. Davis made at his office in Washington this morning. Elmer Davis says, Despite the Germans' accuracy in announcing the invasion before the official Allied communique, German broadcasts should not be relied on in the future. Elmer Davis said the reason the Germans made the announcement so quickly before the Allied communique was released, a couple of hours before, in fact, was possibly that the Germans are trying to build up a reputation for accuracy so that they can then put one over on the Allies later. That's the way Elmer Davis puts it. He says that later on they may try to put one over on us, and that's why they're trying to build up their reputation for accuracy. And then Mr. Elmer Davis asked all Americans to remember that Joseph Goebbels is in business for his health and not for ours. And now at this time at Columbia's news headquarters in New York, we're going to repeat a very colorful broadcast made earlier this morning on this network by CBS correspondent Richard C. Hotlett, who was speaking from London. Those of you who have been with us all along heard Mr. Hotlett's broadcast, and now Mr. Hotlett's report will be read by Joe King. The Allied forces landed in France early this morning. I watched the first landing barges hit the beach exactly on the minute of eighth hour. I was in a Ninth Air Force marauder flying at 4,500 feet along 20 miles of the invasion coast. From all I could see during these first few minutes, there was nothing stopping the assault parties from getting ashore. We spent about half an hour over enemy territory. We flew over and bombed some of the coastal fortifications. But except for some light flak from inland positions and from some kites firing at us, we saw no enemy gunfire. The only other sign of life in enemy territory were some white and yellow parachutes dotting the ground where our paratroopers had hit the ground. The weather is favorable for the operation. Offshore, Allied warships were bombing the enemy coast, and they seemed to be doing it without any opposition. As far as we were concerned, there was no opposition from the air either. The Luftwaffe just didn't seem to be there. What I saw was literally the last minute of the invasion preparations and the first minute of invasion. We were low, but we were traveling fast, and we could not tell how the battle for the beaches would develop. But if the ground action goes as smoothly as the air preparation, we can hope for the best. I went in with a bomber group, probably the hottest group in the Ninth Air Force. Our mission was to plaster the invasion beach and some coastal fortifications with bombs seven minutes before our assault parties came ashore. This group was chosen for the hair trigger work because of its previous superb record. Well, we delivered, and we delivered on time. This is the way it works. Last night, we were told briefing would be at 3 o'clock. We got up at 2, had griddle cakes and fried spam for breakfast, went into the long hut that serves as briefing room. The doors were closed, and the commanding officer announced that the invasion had begun. He said that since midnight, three hours before our paratroopers, some 20,000 of them had been landing in France. I'm reading you a dispatch by Richard C. Hotlett of CBS's London staff. Now to continue. The men cheered. 
The men went on to say that the Air Forces were being called for their maximum contribution. There were going to be more than 1,500 fortresses and liberators flying in ahead of us. Hundreds of medium bombers, too, were going to precede us. And our group was to wind up the pre-invasion bombing. When he said this, the men really cared. To top it off, we were going to have cover from more than 2,500 Allied fighters. The colonel made it plain that nothing was to be left to chance. The weather in the target area had been unsettled and cloudy, and if we were going to deliver precision bombing, we were to have to fly below the clouds, and that we could go down and bomb from 1,000 feet. When he said that not a man blinked an eye, despite the fact that such a low altitude counts as suicide with the marauders. It was still dark when we took off, but one by one those marauders roared down the runway and took off. An hour and a half later, we were out over the English Channel. First, we couldn't see anything at all except a few stray vessels. Great care had been taken to keep our ships from firing at their own planes. Every single bomber and fighter had been painted overnight with special markings on wings and fuselage. And the direction we were to fly, the way we were to turn if we got into trouble, and the recognition signals we were to give had all been very carefully worked out. Even so, when we passed over the first few barges, we had the uncomfortable feeling that we were being shot at. It didn't last long. We were out and away in a matter of minutes. By this time, it was getting on, and the sun was painting the sky a bright orange color on our left. Below us, the English Channel was a fine, deep blue. There were a few white caps, but we got the impression that it wasn't very rough down below. About five miles off the French coast, we saw planes in a steep dive laying a smoke screen. Just about the same minute, the pilot said he saw fires on the shore. I looked as hard as I could, and there down to the left were some naval vessels. They looked like cruisers firing broadsides onto the shore. Their guns belched with flame and smoke. Once I saw a fountain of water not far from one of them, which may have been a shot from the shore or a depth charge. Near the cruisers were dozens of landing craft of all kinds, hardly visible in the early morning haze. All this while, we saw medium bombers and fighters crisscrossing on the way to the target without a sign of a German plane. Then, as we turned in over the coast, about ten minutes before H hour, we saw a fast assault boat race along parallel to the beach, laying a smoke screen. From the way the screen lay, smooth and even, it looked as if there were no wind. We're continuing to read you a dispatch by Richard C. Hottelet of the CBS London staff. Now we continue. We opened our bomb bay doors. Light flak began to come up after us. Off to our left, not near at all, firing only sporadically. The flights ahead of us dropped their bombs. The guns on the ships offshore resumed fire. The bombs and the shells burst together on the target. There were sheets of flame down below, then rolling balls of brown and black smoke. Four and a half thousand feet up, our plane was rocked by the concussion. We got the stench of the explosives. We dropped our bombs as scheduled. And just then we saw down below on our left dozens and scores of white streaks as the assault boats raced over the blue water to the beach, leaving their white wakes stretched out behind them. As we turned away from the target, we saw the boats hit the beach. Then we took evasive action, and I couldn't see any more. Down below, except for some more sporadic smoke, it was a dead country. No sign of life, no vehicles on road, no troop movements. And all the way in, we saw our marauders weaving in and out in perfect formation above us, below us, and around us, on all sides. We didn't see a single one of our planes in distress. The mission wasn't the way we had figured it. We had expected to see German fortifications give back blow for blow with our ships. There was no sign of it. We had expected to see the Luftwaffe out in its full remaining strength to try to stop our planes or at least strike a blow against our landing craft. We didn't see either. We had expected to find enemy territory full of anti-aircraft, alive with reserves moving into threatened areas. We didn't see that. The circumstances of our flight, the fact that we got there simultaneously with the invading troops and left in a minute, make it impossible to draw any far-reaching conclusions on how the battle is going. But one thing we can say already, and that is, our air supremacy over the coastal invasion zone today is not seriously challenged. And that is the report of Richard C. Hottle, at CBS London correspondent, who was over the invasion area in a bomber. And now, back to Bob Trout. That was Bill King reading the dispatch from Richard C. Hotlet 
Uh, it was not exactly a cable dispatch. As a matter of fact, Mr. Hartlett first gave this report as a broadcast direct from London, one of the many broadcasts that were coming in uh, direct from Supreme Headquarters in Great Britain sometime during the night. Uh, those of you who have been with us all night heard Mr. Hartlett's broadcast direct from Great Britain after he had returned from his flight in the Marauder. Here's a dispatch which has just come in. Very brief, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force. It says, as the battle opening the Western Front raged in northern France, General Eisenhower occupied a lonely post on the British side of the Channel. After inspecting parachute troops before they went into the battle, the director of history's greatest amphibious strike stood on the roof of a house watching the huge air armadas roar across the Channel. And now at this point, some of us, I think, would like to know more about landing craft. And so here at Columbia's news headquarters in New York is Major George Fielding Elliott, Columbia's military analyst, who is going to give us a little talk about landing craft at this point. And then later on, we shall continue to give you the news as it comes in to keep you up to date and to refresh you with what we have already given you before. Here is Major Elliott. Now, uh, before uh, beginning to talk to you about landing craft, here is a, a dispatch which has just come in, dated at Army Group Headquarters. General Bernard Montgomery, on the eve of battle, told correspondents, I personally have absolute and complete confidence in the outcome. The party is in first-class shape to win the match, said Montgomery. He believed Field Marshal Erwin Rummel would aim at defeating the operations on the beaches. That is to say, General Montgomery believes that Rummel will not conduct what is called an elastic defense, but will try to throw the Allied landing forces right back off the beach into the sea. But as you have just heard in the reading of Mr. Hotlet's dispatch, that does not appear to be what has happened in the area which Mr. Hoffett had the opportunity of observing. We are a great allied team, Montgomery continues, a terrific allied team. The integration of the British Empire and America going out to battle together. I don't think any other two nations could have done it. I don't know when the war is going to end, but I don't believe the Germans can go on much longer with this business, Montgomery continues. The German soldier is terribly good. But I don't think the German general is as good as he used to be. He has been on the defensive a very long time, and I believe it must affect his mentality. There, I think General Montgomery was speaking of General Rommel, his old opponent in Africa, who is now the commander of the uh, German reserve forces, that is, the German forces which are going to make the main counterattack. So the German general in supreme command of the N.A. invasion forces is Field Marshal General Gerd von Rundstedt, who is Rommel's superior. And now uh, to get on to the question of these landing craft, which are carrying our men across the channel and delivering them on the coast of France. I might introduce that subject by reading a dispatch from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, which I think has been read previously. Uh, in these broadcasts, which says as follows, German destroyers and e-boats are rushing into the operational area off the northern coast of France and no doubt are being dealt with by the Allies. Now, it would be natural for the Germans to put what few destroyers they have, they don't have many left, and their e-boats, that is their fast uh, and uh, heavily armed motorboats, in an attempt to attack our landing craft. Now let's see what some of these landing craft are like. There are well over 50 different types of landing craft in service, each designed for a particular task in the complex operation of seaborne invasion. The uses of landing craft do not end once the first wave of invasion is passed and the beachhead is secured. These craft continue to bring in the equipment and supplies from the bigger ships until docking facilities are available. Landing craft may also be needed to help the Army in land operations. In the crossing of the Valtruno River in Italy, for example, four tank landing craft, escorted by two motor launches, took the tanks across for the Army. 
And we must remember also that landing craft are vulnerable to artillery fire and to air attack, and usually a good many of them are damaged in the course of invasion operations. The damage to landing craft has usually exceeded expectations so that uh, after the first few days there are not so many of them available. Now, the following uh, is a list of some of the types of landing craft with the details of how they work. The assault landing craft, known as the LCA, was the first of the modern type of landing craft, and uh, it is an armored, flat-bottomed steel boat which operates under its own power. The wheelhouse is a small cabin in the forward part of the craft, and the ramp is small and on a level with the gunnel. The troops are carried in two bays, fore and aft, covered by armored decking. The capacity of the LCA is about 35 men. These craft carry out the first assault landing. That is, each of them carries one of the assault groups which were described to you in an earlier broadcast. They are driven right onto the beach, and the bow flap drops down to allow the troops to run straight ashore. This landing craft has a crew of four. A... Uh, then there, there are two other types of uh, a similar nature. There's landing craft personnel, similar to the LCA, but slightly smaller. And the mechanized landing craft, which has a very shallow draft and uh, with twin screws, and is also run right up on the beach. The support landing craft is not really a landing craft at all. It's a powerfully armed ship whose task in, the, in, in an invasion is to go in close to the beaches and cover the initial landing. It has smoke apparatus and mortars, uh, in addition to machine guns and light cannons. The landing craft flak, LCF, is a floating anti-aircraft battery. It, too, is not really a landing craft at all. And we come to the LCT, our landing craft tank. A typical LCT is about 200 feet long, displaces uh, 350 tons, with a draft of three feet forward and seven feet aft, enabling it to run up on a shelving beach. It's a seagoing vessel driven by twin diesel engines and has a crew of 12 men in all. Two-thirds of it are occupied by the tanks or other vehicles, which are placed on a reinforced iron platform with a corrugated surface to prevent them from slipping. These craft are capable of carrying a number of tanks or other vehicles, trucks, uh, armored troop carriers, and so forth, are of guns. When loaded, the vehicles are driven in stern first, packed close together, and lashed in place while at sea. The, uh, the LCT has a hinged ramp in the bows, which enables the tanks or other vehicles to be driven straight ashore. Uh, the LCT, incidentally, is not a good sea boat. Her construction making her easily affected by wind and tides and difficult to maneuver. Nevertheless, the LCTs in the Mediterranean have steamed great distances. One group of them, for example, was at sea off and on for 2,000 hours and seemed about 10,000 miles in that time. Uh, the LCI, or Landing Craft Infantry, is one of the most important types of landing craft and one of the, uh, those of latest design also. The troops are landed directly on the beach by the inclined ramps to port and starboard, which are let down on each side of the bow. This type is considerably larger than the LCA, that is, the assault group, which holds 30 to 35 men. This one will hold a full rifle company of infantry, about 200 men altogether. Then we come to a still larger ship, the LST, or landing ship tank. These ships are the major tank landing craft. They have a shallow draft and are able to go close in shore to discharge their cargoes, the vehicles being driven, driven directly onto the beach from the bows, which open uh, for the purpose. Two huge doors opening to port and starboard. They uh, resemble an oil tanker when seen in profile with a funnel aft. And they're really large ships. They're being vessels of approximately 5,500 tons. The landing ship infantry is the uh, corresponding size in the infantry type of ship, a large vessel of several thousand tons, somewhat resembling a small ocean liner. It's the main infantry carrying unit of the invasion craft. It anchors offshore and lowers barges or assault craft from her davits 
in which the troops are carried ashore. This type of ship is not usually run up on the beach. Then uh, there is a very useful little uh, amphibious craft known as the Duck. It's not, it also is not a landing craft in the normal sense because it can uh, uh, float and propel itself in the water and also on shore. At sea, it looks like a square-bowed launch, the body being boat-shaped and boat-sided. Ashore, it is a six-wheeled, two-and-a-half-ton truck. It has a normal motor engine, which is thoroughly protected from the sea. The engine actuates a propeller at sea, and it drives the wheels when the duck is on land. A changeover is made by a single movement of a special lever. Ducks are carried on board ship as deck cargo and are lowered over the side when they are needed by derricks. The men slide down ropes into them, and supplies are lowered in the normal way. The ducks were first used in the Sicilian campaign. The, and they've also been used in the Pacific by our Marines and other landing forces. The uh, naval vessels chiefly concerned with the close convoying of the invasion armada are minesweepers, trawlers, motor launches, flagships, destroyers, corvettes, and aircraft carriers. The minesweeper, of course, has the task of sweeping up enemy submarine mines, which might otherwise blow up the landing craft, and these will be sowed pretty thickly offshore in areas where the enemy expects us to come in. Trawlers are used also for the same purposes. Uh, Flak ships are just what the name implies, anti-aircraft ships for the protection of the landing craft against enemy air attack. Destroyers and corvettes deal with uh, attempts by enemy destroyers or e-boats to attack the landing craft. Such attacks as have been reported in the dispatch uh, that I read to you at the beginning of this broadcast. And larger craft may also be necessary if the presence of enemy cruisers may be suspected. The enemy has a few large warships left, and of course he may decide to use them to throw them in to do what damage they can do. We may be, may be very sure that the Allied naval forces are taking adequate precautions against any such attempt. Finally, aircraft carriers may be necessary in order to protect the flanks of the movement across the channel against uh, any attempt by the enemy to, uh, to attack them from up or down channel. They may be out a considerable distance where the channel is wider or even well out at sea watching for the approach of enemy uh, naval vessels attempting to raid the channel from either from the North Sea or from the Atlantic side. And this may give you some idea of the landing craft which our men are using, which are conveying them across the channel to France, and some idea also of the immense complexity of the operation which we are now undertaking. And now, here once again is Bob Trout. You've been listening to Major George Fielding Elliott, Columbia's military analyst here at Columbia's news headquarters in New York. Now, before going on with our running coverage of the invasion, which has now started in northern France, uh, let's tell you, let me tell you briefly uh, a few of our immediate plans. Uh, in approximately four minutes from now, just before 7.45, uh, we're going to pause for 30 seconds for station identification, and then at 8 o'clock Eastern wartime, we're going to switch to London for another one of those pool broadcasts. Pool, you know, means that the correspondents are pooling their copy in these in this early stage of the invasion. We've already had several of these pool broadcasts in which we've heard correspondents who represent uh, several various organizations. Among them, of course, we heard our own correspondents. For instance, Richard C. Hotlett, who made the trip over the enemy coast in a marauder plane and who sometime during last night spoke to us directly from Supreme Headquarters in Great Britain and uh, described his flight for us. Also, some, uh, later in the afternoon, King George VI of Great Britain will broadcast at 3 p.m. Eastern Wartime. 3 p.m. Eastern Wartime, and of course, uh, the Columbia Network will carry the broadcast speech of King George, which will be made in London. General de Gaulle has arrived in London. We got that word some time ago, hours ago, sometime during the night, as a matter of fact. 
We don't know whether he will broadcast, but it's quite possible. And, of course, if General de Gaulle does make a broadcast, which is offered for rebroadcast here in the United States, you will hear that, too, over this network. Now, we have quite a few things that we could uh, tell you. Here's a little additional detail on the statement which Prime Minister Winston Churchill made in the House of Commons. And uh, we find in this uh, latest edition that there was grim news as well as good in Mr. Churchill's statement. In discussing the Battle of the Anzio Beachhead in Italy, which was established last January and which was held against heavy German counterattacks, Prime Minister Churchill said the Allies lost about 20,000 men and the Germans 25,000. Those are the figures in the Battle of the Anzio Beachhead, which Mr. Churchill has given to the House of Commons today. The Battle of the Anzio Beachhead in Italy cost the Allies some 20,000 men and cost the Germans some 25,000 men. But, Mr. Churchill said, the Anzio landing had in the end borne good fruit by forcing Adolf Hitler to send south of Rome eight or nine divisions which he might well have needed elsewhere. The latest word from Supreme Headquarters, a brief dispatch which has just come into Columbia's news headquarters here in New York, says, Allied troops have secured a beachhead and dug in military circles here heard early this afternoon. Now, that's a rather interesting wording. That is not an official communique by any means. All it is, all it says is that the uh, dispatch from Supreme Headquarters in Great Britain is quoting military circles there as saying that Allied troops have secured a beachhead and have dug in. And then it goes on to say simply, it is not known presently how deep uh, the penetrations are. Now, just to uh, tell you once again briefly of our plans, at 8 o'clock, that will be in 15 minutes from now approximately, we are going to bring a broadcast to you direct from London, a pool broadcast, and uh, we hope that you will be with us as we continue our invasion coverage. We've been broadcasting all through the night, starting shortly after midnight last night when the Germans first began to put out their reports that the invasion had begun. It was some hours later, it was 3.30 in New York, when uh, the first communique was released in Great Britain, and we learned that the German reports had this time been right and that the invasion of northern France had indeed begun. Well, we shall hear our next broadcast direct from London in approximately 15 minutes, a pool broadcast. And now we're coming to the time when we pause for 30 seconds for station identification. This is Bob Trout speaking to you from Columbia's news headquarters in New York City as Columbia continues its invasion coverage. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Casting from America to France for the Office of War Information, in addition to doing his regular broadcasts for CBS audiences here in our own country. And now, here is Mr. Calvin. You heard Bob Trout report a few minutes ago the news from Stockholm about the Allies landing at 12 points on the coast of France between Le Havre and the Cherbourg Peninsula, with the evident aim, according to these dispatches, of driving straight on to Paris. If that is the way our drive is developing, it's significant to recall President Roosevelt's words only two nights ago to the effect that Rome was the first of Europe's great capitals to fall to Allied arms, and that two others were due to be captured, by which he may well have meant that Paris was next on the list. At any rate, you can well imagine the excitement of the excitable French people as news from our radio is flashed to them and they see the Allies landing in their own beloved Normandy countryside for the liberation of which they've waited so long. We can be sure that the French underground is offering valuable aid to our landing forces and that sabotage of the German defenses is being carried out wherever possible. Some Frenchmen may have been disappointed that General de Gaulle, who has now arrived in England from Algiers, has not as yet broadcast to France, so far as we know. Those speeches by the Premier of Belgium and the Premier of Holland were broadcast hours ago to their people. But it is announced that General de Gaulle will broadcast later in the day. It will be useful at this stage of the invasion news to give you a little background on the kind of country that our boys are going on into in northern France, 
northern France, the only definite locality term used so far by the official Allied communique issued this morning at 3.32 a.m. Eastern Wartime from General Eisenhower's headquarters. Militarily, northern France includes an area approximately 100 miles deep, extending from the frontier of Belgium through Paris to the mouth of the Loire River on the Bay of Biscay. This area is roughly rectangular. I hope you have a map in front of you now to follow me, and is bounded on the south by the Loire, Oise, and Sambre rivers. Two peninsulas thrust out into the English Channel. One is the province of Brittany in the extreme west, from which so far we've had no reports of any Allied invasion activity. And the other is the peninsula known as Cotentin, on which Cherbourg, that great port familiar before the war to so many transatlantic American travelers, where Cherbourg is located. In general, this area of northern France is a rolling plateau varying in elevation from 200 to 650 feet. However, there are some low mountains in Brittany and another low range in South Normandy. In the area where our boys are reported landing, not officially by the Allies, but by the Germans and by these roundabout dispatches from Stockholm, in the area where our boys are reported landing, some of the finest, broadest, and best beaches in the world are located, ideal for landings of landing craft and landing craft tanks. In places, the plateau inland extends all the way to the English Channel, with cliffs along the seashore averaging about 200 feet in height. This, of course, would make infantry landings more difficult, but not impossible. In other places, the plateau drops before reaching the coast, and there are wide, sandy beaches, such as I've just been describing, with good access to the interior, and where, according to CBS correspondent Richard Hartlett, who passed over that area in a plane not many hours ago when the invasion was launched, our troops were not meeting any opposition that was visible to that correspondent from the plane. These cliffs along the Normandy shore are seldom more than 200 feet high, and they're usually sloping and covered with soil. This makes it possible for foot troops to scale them, but they are an obstacle to vehicles. We won't be able to get tanks in that way. However, there are numerous streams cutting through the cliffs along the Channel and Basin coast and forming ravines and valleys to the ports and the beaches. Through, through some of these breaks in the cliff line, there are railroads and main highways. Through others, there are paths which could be widened and graded for the passage of military vehicles. Back of the coastal area, all of northern France is thickly cultivated and studded with towns and cities. There's a dense network of both surface roads and railroads. We don't know, of course, the extent of damage that our bombing has done to intercept these facilities. In the invasion, the roads will probably be of greater importance than the railroads, the highways, that is, where the French underground will be able to offer us valuable assistance. French saboteurs are expected to interrupt communications by rail. The indications so far are that the Germans will depend mainly, will have to depend mainly, on these highways for the rapid movement of their troops. And it may therefore be necessary to land parachute forces in increasing numbers to seize these key road junctions. I turn the microphone now back to Bob Trout here in the CBS newsroom in New York. Ned Calmer has been giving us some facts about the coastal area of France. And now here on the other side of me in our CBS News headquarters, is our war correspondent, Quentin Reynolds, who is going to discuss some of the German defenses which Allied troops may have met this morning on the coast of northern France. Mr. Reynolds will give us this discussion based on his experiences at Dieppe, at Salerno, and also the information which he has got by studying Royal Air Force reconnaissance photographs. And now here is Quentin Reynolds. All night long, while giving you the brief official communiques and eyewitness reports of our correspondents who have returned from France to London, we have been attempting to visualize the pattern of this invasion. Gradually, it seems to be taking shape. Our army struck, according to the German radio, between La Havre and Cherbourg, in the Bay de la Seine, a field of operations stretching roughly about 60 miles. This is about 50 miles southwest of Dieppe. 
Ned Calmer has just described the terrain of that part of France to you. Now, apparently, we obtained something at 2.25 a.m. this morning, which not even the most optimistic military observer hoped that we would attain. That is, tactical surprise. We landed on the sandy beaches in the Deauville and Trueville area. For months, the Germans have sneered that these beaches were absolutely invulnerable. They didn't think that we'd dare to land on sandy beaches. Sandy beaches can be mined, and it is almost impossible to land on a beach that is heavily mined without incurring great casualties. The beaches in front of Dieppe, where we landed in August 1942, were not sandy. They were not mined. That's because they were what the British call shale beaches. No sand, merely boulders and small rocks, rounded by the constant action of the tides. You can't mine shale beaches because the water striking the shore keeps shifting the rocks and the boulders, and this motion is enough to set off the mines. But mines buried underneath the sand remain there until an unwary foot treads upon them, or the weight of a tank or a... General Clark said to me, we're spitting right into the mouth of the lion. General Eisenhower, apparently convinced by the success of the Salerno operation, decided to spit once more into the mouth of the lion. Instead of attempting various flanking movements or diversionary movements or feints, he led to his enemy's strength. And the enemy's strength was not good enough to keep us from landing. This part of the coast has always been considered the best defended portion of the entire French coast. In short, Eisenhower and Montgomery attempted to trump Germany's ace, and early reports indicate that General Ike took the trick. We landed on some of the best beaches in the world, long, rolling, sandy beaches, once the playground of Europe. But somehow or other, we managed to neutralize the thousands of mines which must have lurked under the hard innocent-looking white sand. Our sappers have been well-trained in the business of making enemy mines innocuous. They know all about the so-called S-mines, which our men call the bouncing baby. They know about the telemines and the tripwires, which will set off half a dozen buried grenades if you stumble over them. They know about the three-pronged igniters that stick a few inches above the ground. They can see these. They can't see the so-called platter mines, almost as thin as phonograph records, which are buried a foot below the surface of the ground. We know that early this morning, the first men to dash out of the landing barges were the sappers with their detecting devices. These reveal the presence of all metal mines. They do not reveal the presence of the plastic mines the Germans used in Sicily and on the road to Rome. But perhaps by now, the genius of our scientists has found an answer to these, too. The army authorities are silent on this subject. There are cabanas and small country villas behind the beaches of Deauville. Our men knew all about them and about the danger that lurked inside them. The Germans are masters of the booby trap. Our men had orders never to open the door of any of these buildings. You turn the doorknob, and a bomb will explode. Instead, our men were told to send a blast of Tommy gun fire at the doorknob, shoot off the lock, push the door open with a long stick, and then enter. And when they took refuge in these villas and in the farmhouses and barns which dot the French countryside and back of the beaches, they had further orders. They were told not to move a chair or a table, not to straighten a picture on the wall, not to pick up a fountain pen or pencil they might find on a desk or table. All of these might be and undoubtedly were booby traps. At the ep, every farmhouse was mined or booby trapped in this manner. These were merely some of the initial barriers our men encountered and which we have all seen here in RAF reconnaissance photographs. We know this from the photographs and from past experiences in amphibious landing. How successfully 
our men conquer these diabolically clever defenses can best be realized by the fact that some three hours ago, the German radio admitted that American troops were fighting ten miles inland. This is Quentin Reynolds, who's been speaking to us here at Columbia's news headquarters in New York. Now, just to remind you again, we're going to bring you a broadcast from England in approximately 30 seconds, but now we break for 30 seconds for station identification. Bob Trout speaking at our news headquarters in New York. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is D-Day, the day of the Allied invasion of Western Europe, and CBS World News brings you the invasion reports of its correspondents at home and abroad called in by Alan Jackson. This is the situation at the moment. Allied troops have landed along a hundred-mile stretch of the French coast. Thousands of paratroopers and glider-borne forces have descended behind the enemy lines. Thousands of Allied warplanes are supporting the operation, and so far, it appears to have met little opposition. The greatest naval armada in history took the troops across the channel. And now here is Alan Jackson, one of Columbia's news editors. American radio correspondents in London are ready now with the latest details of the invasion. First, we hear from CBS correspondent Richard C. Hotlet. Go ahead, London. This is CBS New York calling London. Go ahead, Richard C. Hotlet. Invasion of Europe. Speaking in the House of Commons, Mr. Churchill said that these landings are the real thing. He said this after German radio reports had tried to insinuate it might be a false alarm or a diversion which might be called off. The Prime Minister also said that the fire of the shore batteries has largely been quelled. I can confirm that in part because this morning, precisely at H hour, I flew over 20 miles of the invasion coast in a marauder and did not see a German coastal battery fire a shot. Mr. Churchill revealed that the invading forces had not found the German underwater obstacles as difficult as we had feared and that the landings on the beaches are still going on which means that within six hours of the commencement of seaborne operations, the invasion of Europe has cleared the first hurdle. Not only that, but the progress has been so satisfactory in this initial phase that Mr. Churchill felt able to say, we may have had tactical surprise. This is excellent news. But it's well to remember that the critical period of an operation on this scale is expected to last at least a week. The men are on the beach now, but until enough heavy equipment is ashore to deal with German counterattacks, we are not out of danger. We must expect those counterattacks momentarily. We may be cautious here in London this morning, but don't get the impression we're gloomy. Far from it. The strength that's been thrown into this operation is staggering. Mr. Churchill said that more than 4,000 ships and several thousand smaller craft have already crossed the channel. He told of the mass airborne landings behind the enemy lines. The Germans say we landed four divisions by parachute and glider, which may be somewhat exaggerated, but there were at least 20,000. And the Prime Minister gave another example of how many chips we have in this game by announcing that the Allied Expeditionary Force is sustained by 11,000 first-line aircraft which can be called upon as needed. This is another fact of considerable significance. It's another way of saying that the Royal Air Force is prepared to put its night bombers into the sky by daylight if the need should arise. With the RAF ready to bomb by day in an emergency, we could carry out in any threatened area a bombing offensive without equal or precedent. The British Prime Minister wound up his short resume in the House of Commons by saying that As the battle grows in size and intensity for many weeks, we will give the enemy many more surprises. 
The remarkably swift development of this first day is pointed up by the fact that Mr. Churchill felt it possible to make the statement he did only two hours after the Supreme Command here issued a cautious and vague communique.